Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. I can see that we already have people joining us today. Welcome, welcome. It'll take us a few more minutes before we start today's webinar. Um, so feel free to just grab a quick drink uh, and share in the chat where you're joining us from today. Uh, and then we'll give a few more minutes to other people joining today's session as well. But welcome. Excited to see everyone here. We already see, oh, we're already past 100 people. Ooh, we have people from all over. Let's see, we have Switzerland, Amsterdam, Scotland, Argentina. Also, please feel free to share. What's the weather like over there? I'm calling in from Amsterdam and we've had a glimpse of spring last week, but now unfortunately we're back to, I wouldn't say winter, more fall. Um, so curious to, to hear what the weather is like over at your side. Please feel free to share where you're joining us from. Welcome. Ah, oh, I see a lot of sunny destinations. I feel like I can also use this chat now as a holiday inspo <laughs> list. Sunny but cold. I'll take sunny but cold over rain and warmer. Montana, UK is gray is gray. Yeah, I feel like Amsterdam and UK are in the same boat. So I feel you. <laughs> Hello from Brazil, Chicago, sunny and cold. Melbourne, Australia, I bet it's sunny there. Although it might be winter there, I'm not actually sure. Cold and snowy in Montreal. I hope that everyone who is in a colder destination is warm and cozy inside, ready to uh, spend the hour with us today. Hello from Toronto. Sunny in East Texas as well, great. Hello from Detroit, Buffalo, New York. A lot of US, India, ah. Sunny and cool in Richmond. Hello from Portland. So nice to see people from all over. Very inspiring, a global audience today. Uh, we'll give it one more minute for more people <clears throat> to join uh, before we start today's session. So thank everyone for joining us today. Excited for you to <clears throat> join us and help drive today's se uh, session, really. Uh, more on that a little bit later. Hello from Indiana. Yeah. And of course, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. That's, That's right. right. <gasps> Actually, Luke <clears throat> reminded me that I have not gotten a gift this year yet. So. Oh. Mm. Well, did you give a gift? Uh, I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but not until I get mine. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm going to do the webinar and then uh, my wife is whisking me away for a for an afternoon and an evening uh, away. And then uh, I'm taking tomorrow off and then we're just going to be relaxing and enjoying. So I'm I'm excited for the webinar. And and the good news is that this fits my definition of work because this isn't work. This is talking with <laughs> one of my friends. I think that's the ultimate goal, right? If you have work that you love and enjoy, then you'll never work right. in your life. That's what they say, I guess. So, that's why yeah. I retired and, and unretired. <laughs> that's right. He, right. And I'm seeing in the chat people from Ontario, from Buffalo. For all the people from Buffalo, hey, I grew up in North Tonawanda. So shout out to the to the to the uh, upstate New York. Yeah. So we have more right. people joining. I see more people from Europe now as well. We have Finland, Germany, Finland. UK. And we've even got uh, um, the MENA region with Dubai. I was just in um, Riyadh a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, quite lovely. Um, and I see one of our partners, Etienne Laverde. Hey, Etienne, glad you're here. Um, Tom, a North Tonawanda shout out. Holy cow. <laughs> this is great. Uh, my friend Melissa Reeve, who's uh, an expert, Jim, in algal marketing. So it's nice to see Melissa here. Uh, Great. All right. So we're at three minutes past six. So I think that's about time for us to get started. So hello again, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. We're so thankful that you're taking the time out of your day to join us here today. My name is Lisa. I work as one of the product marketeers over at Miro. And I'm uh, joining uh, my co-host for today's session, Luke, um, who's our uh, partner over at Applied Frameworks. We've been running this Agile Expert webinar series 
just over a year already. Look, time's flying by. <laughs> um, and today we're going to be uh, listening in to Luke and a guest speaker who I'll introduce in a quick second, but you can already see him. Um, so I wanted to call out before we start that today's session will be recorded. So for everyone wondering um, if they can review the session later on or if you have to drop a little bit early, no problem at all. We'll be sure to share the recording at the end of the webinar through email. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, today's session really is going to be uh, shaped uh, with the inputs uh, from today's audience. So make sure that you post your questions in the Q&A box. As you can already tell, we have a lot of people joining us today and the chat is growing really fast. So if you wanna increase your chances of us picking up on your questions and making sure that we can feed them into Jim and Luke's conversation, make sure to post them in the Q&A section and we'll try and get them answered today. Um, so all that's left for now for me to do is introduce our two great speakers of today, starting with Luke, who I've already mentioned. Luke uh, is uh, my co-host of today. Uh, he join, uh, joins us from Applied Frameworks, which is the partner of this webinar series. And Luke specifically has asked me to introduce him as uh, not only our partner, but also a man who provides positive energy to systems that need it. And I can already tell you, having worked with Luke for uh, a couple of months already, that the positivity that he brings into every conversation really is contagious. So I'm excited for him to bring in his positive energy to today's conversation. Luke, thanks so much for joining us today. And then Hi, we also have our guest speaker, and I'm excited to announce that we are joined by Jim Highsmith. Uh, Jim, as you probably will already uh, all know, um, is uh, was basically the foundational person when it comes to the original Agile Manifesto. And we get a chance to hear him uh, talk uh, to Luke today about basically what has gone well, but also what hasn't gone well when it comes uh, to Agile or what hasn't gone as well as we um, had hoped. And then also uh, to hear them speak a little bit more about the future of Agile, uh, including AI, like all of the opportunities that we see there. Um, I think there's many ways to introduce Jim, but I think the three keywords I'd like to use here are uh, Jim, is an adventurer, a catalyst, and a storyteller. And I can't wait to sit back and hear him tell his stories uh, today. So Luke and Jim, over to you. And yeah, let's kick it off. Thanks, All right. Lisa. Well, thanks so much, Lisa. So you, when you talk to people like Jim and me, we've got some pretty deep history with Agile. And Jim's history is even further. So I think some of our audience, Jim, would benefit from some pre-Agile history. And one of the things I like to talk about was that before we called it Agile, we used to call it things like Iterative and in, in Incremental Development, or IID, or uh, Barry Bain called it the Spiral Method, and there were other names. And so the problem that I had with IID is that IID sounds like a disease that you don't really want to <laughs> catch. And spiral sounds like you could be spiraling off into infinity or spiraling down the drain or doing something that doesn't sound very good. And so agile sounds like something you want to do. And so my question is, is agile really just a better name? Is it better marketing or is it a little bit more than just better marketing? Well, Luke, I by the way, I... Appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you. We haven't uh, we haven't connected in a few years, and so this is a good opportunity to do that. And I, I really appreciate it. I'll talk about that in just a minute because I think it's more than marketing. If you think about things like the spiral model uh, and some of the stuff that went before rapid application development, it was all leading up. It was all background. I read all of that stuff, including Tom Gilb's stuff. Uh, Barry Beam stuff, and and even before it goes back further than that. But let me just start a little further back in the mid '60s, when I was just coming out of engineering school, and we were designing circuits with transistors that were about the size of the end of a pencil. Today, Microsoft has a new AI new AI chip that has 105 billion transistors on it. If you took the area of the pen and blew it up 105 billion times, it would be something on the order of two square miles, about the size of Hoboken, New Jersey. 
that's how far we've come just in terms of processors and speeds and the shrinking of chips in that period of time. So I'll sort of skip from there to the early 90s. And what was going on in the 90s was pre kind of pre was kind of pre agile. We called it rapid application development. The mantra during the 90s, as things began to heat up and change more rapidly, was it was from IT managers, and it, they, they said three things: it takes too long, costs too much, delivers the wrong product. And let me give you an example of that. In about 1995, I was asked to come into Nike in Portland, Oregon, or actually in Beaverton, Oregon, to help them with a project. They had spent two, 18 months on this project for the apparel department, and they had a requirements document that was out of date. It had no code, no design. All they had was a requirements document after 18 months. So a friend of mine was in there, and I had been talking to him about this rapid application development stuff I had been doing. And so he invited me in to talk to the CIO of the company. And so Nike was a very laid back place. And so my biggest question mark going in to interview the CIO was what to wear. And so what I ended up doing was, you know, slacks and a nice shirt and red Nike running shoes. And he recognized the shoes and I got the job. So I don't know if it's because of the shoes or because of what I had, what I had to say. We took that project and did one week, uh, one month iteration, six one month iterations and generated an application that they put on, put into play at the end of that six months. That was the kind of thing that was going on in the 90s. There were three domains and three technologies that kind of drove things in the 90s. The three domains were object-oriented programming was coming along. There was a difference in aerospace engineering and what I'd call the structured development stuff that was being done in business. The aerospace engineering companies were using things like spiral models and, and those kinds of things. The business community was just still doing structured the other thing that happened in the mid 90s, which caused an enormous change, were the internet, GUI interfaces, and again, object oriented programming. What the internet and GUI interfaces did for the industry is they changed the whole focal point of software development. They changed it from internal systems to external customers. And that was a huge change that not everybody has realizes. And, and those speeding up things, the change to the internet and GUI interfaces were two of the things that kind of drove people into doing iterative development and that became agile development. Got it. And I and I think the um, in terms of the uh, influences that you list, um, I was writing them down. And just to reiterate some of them, we had object-oriented programming, which were which gave us better abstractions and better tools. We had the GUI user interface. One more thing that I'm going to add to this, Jim, that I think is actually quite profound was that the patterns movement started to gain steam at that same time. And I remember when I used to work for electronic data systems, we would create those large requirements documents. And what I realized was that those large requirements documents embodied a few things. There was usually a section at the beginning for vision, like this is what we want to do. Then there was a section for kind of a roadmap, and then there was a section for the more detailed requirements. And then, of course, we would build these out. And, and in many times, the interaction between the technical people and the business people were such that the business people would say, well, this is kind of where we want to go. And the technical people knew that there would be change in the system, so they'd ask more questions. Well, that conversation at that time had to be documented in such a way that the requirements grew. One of the things that I think happened was that we started to see patterns in systems it, the, and we knew the patterns existed, but we started to document them. And so then, and the, the, my favorite example from the meta pattern structure is data warehousing, right? It's a common need in business to analyze our data in multiple ways. And in the seventies and eighties, those data warehouses were bespoke. They were built one at a time. But then we had Ralph Kimball start to publish data warehousing patterns. And we had David Hayes publish business model patterns. And we started to see patterns. And I think another enabler of what has become agile is this idea that, wait a minute, I can still have a vision. And we talk about vision. And I can still have a roadmap. 
but I don't need as many detailed requirements because I can take a pattern off the shelf. And Grady Booch has done some really interesting work here with documenting uh, large numbers of patterns, but I can identify a pattern of, you know, no one builds an e-commerce system from scratch anymore. We have patterns for that. And I think that that's one of the things that really moves us into the agile world out of the rad and jad world or the spiral world, because Spiral was still in that era of, of more, I would say, invention, which is great. And it's not a criticism, but now we've got patterns. And, and I think another enabler to, to the swirling set of things that enabled Agile to be what it is, is patterns. Yeah. And, you know, the pattern movement kind of grew up on the OO side of things. So that people like Kent Beck and Ron Jeffries and Chet Henderson, Hendrickson, we're all part of that patterns movement, as was um, Ward Cunningham. Yeah, Ward and Cunningham. Ward's, sure. Ward's wiki that they, they use for patterns, it was, it was kind of a patterns wiki. Uh, and then it kind of turned into an XP wiki over over time. It became more and more the, the uh, catalyst for XP. And one of the things people don't realize is, to, is that in 2001, when the manifesto was written, we didn't have any social media to speak of. It was all conference speeches, art magazine articles, and and Ward's Wiki was a big part of that of getting the word out about agile OO and patterns. So let's talk about that, right? Because this evolution, this confluence of factors coming in, um, I, I think you might know that I used to be a heavy duty OOP guy. I was a small talker, or et cetera. So then you and some friends got together and created the. Agile Manifesto, which which I actually suspect took off in ways that you might not even have imagined. Like I think you might have had something bigger than you expected when it was all done. Yeah, I don't think anybody um, that was there at that meeting, all 17 of us, had any idea that it was going to take off the way it did. And it's interesting because people want to go back to the manifesto and I think it's a good source document but they have to realize that the concepts behind the agile manifesto have to be kind of extended to some of the stuff that's going on today and we can talk about that a little bit later but well, really, let's, go right, let's go there right now I mean if, if you look at the agile manifesto right it starts with a set of four values and then it promotes a set of principles or practices and so let's let's what some which aspects of those values and principles do you think have stood the test of time and which do you think might be in in need of maybe a fresh coat of paint let me back up just a little sure i think there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about the difference between methods methodology and mindset and i think this is where we get some of bogged down sometimes methods or practices are things like test driven development stand-ups, uh, sprint planning. Those are all practices. A methodology or a framework, and I know framework has become a bad word these days, which is too bad. Uh, we, we can't get rid of all the words we've been using or we're not gonna be left with any words to use. Uh, but methodology or framework is stringing together a bunch of practices into somewhat of a systems development life cycle. And then a mindset is how does your mind work? Is it a is it a plan do mindset or is it an envision explore mindset? And we can talk about the different aspects of mindset and culture. And so what I think happens is some people think that uh, agile is a methodology. It really encompasses all of those things, including the mindset. There is no such thing. I I, I keep reading articles right for a while about the agile methodology. There's no such thing. Uh, <laughs> And and methodologies can be simple or they can be complicated. And I think back about Alistair Coburn's idea of crystal methods, and he had some dimensions on his methodology. So he, he taught criticality versus number of people. So as the number of people went up, the, the, the amount of, of uh, rigor that you needed went up and the amount of documentation you went up. If you had a small team of six people doing... Um, a non-life critical system that requires a different methodology. So it, 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 remains, it means that you've got to design methodology to meet the criteria or the context of your particular problem. That's another interesting thing about the manifesto. I, I, I think there are originalists and they're pragmatists related to the manifesto. 
an originalist uh, originalist says the manifesto says software and by damned it's software the pragmatist says you can apply outcomes or products where you where software is in the manifesto so you can that's the way you interpret it uh the next thing is it can evolve from agility as a core mindset so for example i was involved in 2005 6 and 7 with an organization called the Agile Project Leadership Network. And so it was taking the Agile mindset and applying it to project management. And so we rewrote some of the values, empowering and trusting teams, embracing and adapting to change, facilitating collaboration and communication. I can trace those directly back to the manifesto, but it's a different set of words. And I've seen people do this for product management and some other things. So it's extending the, the intent of the manifesto into other areas. And so what I would like people to do is to realize that it's not static, it's not uh, that it that it's pragmatic and it can evolve. Yeah, I like that. And so I think that the the notion of the values and and I when I was on the board of the Agile Alliance, I used to talk about how in, in, you have kind of layers of durability, right? The values are the more durable aspects than the practices because we vary the practices or the principles uh, as we need to. And I also agree that that Alistair's model of the different methods and the different um, needs of different teams and different team sizes are paramount in terms of understanding how are we going to behave in a particular context? Like what is our organization? What is our team doing? And like you said, am I building life, you know, mission critical systems or life critical systems, or am I building a game? And sure there's economic impact, but it, there's different levels. One and I also, things, go ahead. One of the things I talk about in my project management book is a, what I call an exploration factor. And it's a technology exploration fact, technology uh, uh, bit of it. And then there's a how how flexible the requirements are. And so an exploration factor one means it's technology that's well known. Everybody knows how to do it. And the requirements are not going to change. And a, number 10, the requirements are changing all the time. And I don't know what they are. And I'm using a, a bleeding edge soft, uh, technology. And each of those kinds of projects with different exploration factors require different kinds of methods and practices. Right, agreed. So now when you look at the impact of the principles, some of the principles seem to have spawned entire industries of platforms and tools, right? You mentioned TDD. Well, TDD is, is there's tools that exist for TDD, like given when then in Gherkin or, you know, Cucumber, there, like there's actual infrastructure. So what's, and we've got some questions about AI and we know that AI is kind of an important topic right now and we're gonna cover AI a couple of different ways, but what's your take on some of the tools that have evolved from the, from the in a sense, the guidance given or the, or the inspiration given by the manifesto and how might these tools start to continue to further evolve with AI? Well, I think there are two aspects of this. One of one is which is how how can the tools evolve, but the second one is sort of an implied idea that somehow tools and frameworks are the problem, and that somehow this uh, agile industrial complex is a problem. And I would like to say that yes, there are some issues, but I think bashing frameworks doesn't get at the core issues that are what I'll call disappointments in agile. So rather than say success and failure, I like to say for even for a particular project, what have we accomplished and what are our disappointments rather than accelerate and fail? So I, I listed four things that I thought are disappointments in Agile that I can see over the years. Number one is the capability is spread too thin. And I'll go back to Jerry Weinberg's law of strawberry jam. The wider you spread it, the thinner it gets. And out on the edges, it's pretty damn thin. So you have novices teaching novices about Agile, which is not a, not a great way to go. Um, there's a balance between, if you think about the core two things that came out of the Agile Manifesto meeting was that producing excellent software was uh, one objective and building better workplaces, he healthier workplaces was another. Those were the two key things. It's like performance and people 
And I think to some extent, the people side in, in the last 10 years or so is we put too much emphasis in that and not enough on performance. And I'll give you an example of that in just a minute. Uh, organization and leadership. One of the things we found is that agile teams and agile, play, agile groups within IT, we need the organization to be more agile in order for the software area to be more agile. And that's one we're still, still working on. And then the last one is a fixed mindset. I think if you read Carol Dweck's uh, book, 60% of the world is fixed mindset and 40% is, is growth mindset. And that really has to do with your ability to change. Uh, and so I think those are some things that get at this. Now, let me just talk a little bit about performance versus people. So performance is customer value, financial, it's business benefits. People is a healthy work environment. If you think about what we've been calling this sort of new modern management, we've got some names for them. Empathetic, servant, self-organization, well-being leadership, collaborative leadership. It doesn't say anything about getting the job done. It's about how you deal with people. And those are very necessary, but I think we've gone a little bit too far. A friend of mine who's a CIO, when he goes into a, do an agile transformation, he identifies two, two kinds of people, enablers and doers. And the enablers are everybody in the management chain, including scrum masters, project managers, agile coaches, people like that. And the others are the people that are actually developing and, and delivering. And you've got to have both. But I think in the agile community, we've gotten out of whack a little bit. And in fact, I see companies that are not that are, that are being touted as getting rid of Agile, what they're doing is they're rebalancing the ratio of enablers and doers. And I think that's the thing that's happening in a lot of organizations today. And I think the other thing too, is that the, the balance is going towards more engineering talent and more, engineer, more talent dis, dis, uh, density in the engineering area and, and less emphasis on, on the enablers and more on those doers. Well, there's a lot there. So I, I took I took down four notes and I'm going to um, come back to them. But I, I want to say, Jim, that I think that your um, what you just said about the business side, like and I'm this for everyone listening, this is part of the reason why Jim and I are so happy to reconnect, because that is the focus of our my last book with Jason Tanner, Software Profit Streams. We are deeply concerned that the Agile community has completely shifted the, the emphasis and the ratio a little too much towards what you said, which is the people and environment side. Like, And it's not to discount that, but at the end of the day, it's a whole lot easier to pay the bonuses and have the nice work environment when the company is making a sustainable profit. And when we talk about what you just said, the business, the finances, understanding value and modeling value. And some of that was done by Tom Gill, right, with um, Plangwidge and a few other things. But, but but really bringing that forward, I'm so glad you're saying this because we're in alignment with you. We, we believe that, that one of the greatest dangers that's happening right now is that the Agile community tends to run around saying, I'm going to create value, or I'm going to create a value stream, and I'm going to produce value. And they don't define it. They don't put a number on it. They don't. They don't manage it. And it's really, really frustrating. Um, but I was, Go ahead. Let me let me give you an example. One of one of the things my friend did was go into an organization to take a look at their uh, agile transformation. They had ninety eight developers, and he asked me the question: How many project managers do you think they had? Ninety eight. Yeah. <laughs> 98 project managers for 98 developers. And, and one of the reasons for that is they were heavily siloed and they were had, they had five or six projects per person. And so they needed all these project managers to manage all the dependencies between all these projects that were going on and all these functional areas. So it wasn't the project manager's fault. It was an organizational problem that led to that. And a reasonable level, this friend of mine it gives us about 15% ratio of enablers to doers, that would have meant that 98 project managers would be reduced to 17. Right. And 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 those ratios we know in other parts of, of 
of management science, um, how many people report to you and what happens when people increase that number. Many times people think it's bad things, but often if you increase the number of direct reports, it's good things because it forces the leader to delegate and forces the leader to trust their people more as opposed to quote unquote, it's, it's a lot easier to micromanage two people than it is to micromanage, <laughs> you know, 17 in two different teams when you start to let the team structures emerge. I want to go back to one more thing that you talked about, and I think it's 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 quite relevant. Um, this this and we talked about this. You said, "What have we accomplished, and what are some of the disappointments?" And I love that framing, and I think it's a healthy framing. Uh, it belies your own growth mindset when you say disappointment as opposed to failure, because you're looking at this from that different mindset. One of the questions that I'd like to talk about is the notion, and we've seen it, in, and I'm bringing it up because it's flying through the chat, Jim, is this notion of, of novices teaching novices or people who don't have the deeper experience. And, and this is a tension because at one level, we do want to bring in new voices. We do want to bring in fresh blood. But at another level, there's some concern that that some of the ways in which we're we're sharing our tribal knowledge is 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 degrading that knowledge, and I don't I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or or what might happen about that. Well, one of the things that I've been thinking about recently, because I've also been thinking about the application of AI to management, and that so that's one of the areas I've been looking at, and so to really think about capability as opposed to knowledge. And capability is equal to three things. It's equal to knowledge. So knowledge is something that AI can help for, help with right away. But the other two things, it's a little fuzzier. Knowledge plus experience. So what experiences have you had that you can bring to add context to the knowledge that you have? And then the final one is judgment. Do you have the, what it takes to make judgments about what you're experiencing and what you based on that knowledge and what are you doing those judgments on and are you taking taking enough risky are you doing enough risky things so that you are, can innovate and it's harder to say how ai can be applied to experience and judgment those are some of the things that humans can do that ai not yet at least has has a good handle on so it's not just gaining knowledge and that for example i used to kind of be anti-certification. Where I come from, certification, I, I've gotten two kinds of certification, professional engineering certification and a CPA from accounting. And those are certifications that require very uh, extensive tests, experience in, a, in the job in order to get those certifications. So I don't look at the certifications these days. I look at them differently. I look at them as sort of boy and girl scout get merit badges. You know, you, you you did you you did this. You know, you made fire. You get a merit badge, uh, and and so I, I don't have a problem with those types of certifications or those kinds of merit badges, but those don't give you experience or judgment, and that's what I think is missing from a lot of these novices teaching novices. And the other thing too, if you get if you take if you take the area the uh, beginner intermediate expert, you just take those three and moving between those three, you can kind of map those things together. Beginners uh, have knowledge or gain knowledge. Intermediates have people that have some experience and can add that experience to that knowledge. And experts are people who can change the things because they, uh, they, they know how to use practices and adapt those practices to new things. And we don't have enough time in some of these organizations to go through that intermediate expert step. And the other thing is we don't have a good life cycle to do that. So it, it's really interesting. You use agile development in order to do iterative development of products, right? Shouldn't right. you use the same approach to use iterative development of your processes and practices and methodology? In general, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think the challenge on experience is that there there is a wide set of research in cognitive psychology that talks about the 10,000 hours of practice to become an expert. And the areas in which we might be able to short circuit some of that through AI, but the 
challenge with AI, and and we we have an AI tool at Applied Frameworks called Horizon, and and it's designed to help product managers and product owners in making better choices about pricing and licensing. And what we found in our own use of AI and in our own AI tool is that when you're viewing the AI as a partner in divergent thinking, it tends to work better. When you start to put too much pressure on AI systems in convergent thinking, that's when you start to get those forced hallucinations, right? The AI is going to make something up to try and, um, uh, uh, you know, adjust its algorithm. So I think we're we're kind of it's exciting to um, uh, look at the some of these um, opportunities and some of these gaps. And the other thing that you talked about was you 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 use the words knowledge, experience, and judgment. And I like those terms. And, and Jim, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the world of civic education and civic development, the, the, that world uses the, world, the words knowledge, skill, and disposition. And, and, it, and it largely parallels what you were talking about. In the civic engagement world, we talk about knowledge. Do I know the structure? And I'm going to for all of our international people, please forgive me. I'm just going to limit in time to the U.S., but the knowledge of the U.S. government, what's the Congress, what's the House, what's the Senate, what's the um, executive branch? Skill. Can I read a bill and understand what that bill means to me? Is it going to raise my taxes? Is it going to change the finances? Disposition. Am I more conservative? Am I less conservative? Uh, how do I feel about certain things? And this dis and I agree with you that that we can definitely see the AIs helping in knowledge. We can see them collaborating with experience, right? I, I can start to trade my experience with the AI, and the, and in the judgment and or disposition, it starts to be less effective. So let's let's change this a little bit. I, I'd like to bring in something that I know is near and dear to your heart. You're leading this new reimagining agile initiative. And the first question I have is, you know, what are some of the goals that you have? And then the second question is, how did you select the individuals who are participating? And why should the agile community writ large listen to the people who are reimagining agile for others? Well, let me do the second one first. Uh... This is a group of people who got together at kind of ad hoc last year at the Agile Conference in Orlando. And so it was Heidi Musser, who was at that point was the board chair of the Agile Alliance, uh, Sanjeev Augustin, who's a good friend of mine, and John Kern. John had invited me to the conference to be on a panel with him about this kind of reimagining Agile, and I had done some work in that area. And so it, it's kind of, and we got together at the conference and said, you know, this is something that is a, we think is a good idea. Let's do something with it. So it was an ad hoc group of people. Uh, and one of the things that we've done is we've, we've called ourselves the launch group. We're not trying to control, manage, organize anything. We're trying to give people a forum and an idea to run with it. When people say, how can they help? We, we turned that around and said, what can you do to further this idea? You know, can you have a, can you, can you write a blog? Can you have a, a, a podcast? Can you have a presentation at a conference? And you'd ask what, what, I, what, what I would deem success is to regenerate some of the enthusiasm for agility that we had in the early years. If you go back and you read the manifesto, it's got four pie four pieces in that manifesto. It's got the manifesto, the values. It's got a principles page. It's got a page about history. It's got a page about the the uh, authors. And I guess it's got six things. And it's got a, a page where you can sign up and say, I, I agree with the man Agile manifesto, or I think this is bullshit. Go back, go back and read a couple of those pages from the early years and the enthusiasm for something that's brand new comes comes across. And I'm hoping that some of that enthusiasm that we had 23 years ago can be injected into the Agile community because I think it's a really important. And I in getting ready for this talk, I actually came up with a new tagline. Okay. If you if you failed at Agile, 
you will fail at AI. Okay. And I think that's true because AI is going to change things in ways we really don't understand and they're going to change them rapidly. And in, unless you have a finely tuned growth mindset and agile adaptive mindset, you're going to get lost. So I think those two things go together. And that's why I think there needs to be new enthusiasm about agile and agility. Okay. So, so the, the, what we'll want to do is we'll want to put into the, to the webinar notes, how do people get involved? Um, and I don't want to go into that now because I know that that's going to change and that's going to improve. So we'll have to put some links in the show notes, but I've got to ask a few tougher questions. Um, a lot of people have made a lot of money from agile and a lot of people are upset that they didn't make money as much as other people. So what are some of the monetary implications? Because a lot of companies, a lot of consultants, like for example, you talked about the, the danger of novices teaching novices, but given that there's no, in a sense, uh, certification board, which you talked about, it's pretty easy for a relatively unskilled, but maybe dynamic person to write a new book. And we see this all the time. Here's my new agile book. And I'm some new, exciting, dynamic person, and I'm a good speaker, and you should follow my method. And maybe that method isn't actually very sound, but they're going to make money at it. So how do we deal with some of the um, you know, monetary aspects about who's going to win and who's going to lose economically about uh, if this new reimagining Agile or this next wave of Agile succeeds? I always like to ask the question, what did people expect was going to happen? <laughs> you know, is did you expect anything else is going to happen? As it became more and more popular, then the tools vendors got in and, the, and the, you know, the people who teach workshops. And it's interesting that a lot of, I feel like a lot of the people who are naysayers at this point are themselves making a lot of money out of Agile. They're just doing it a different way than they say this, this group over here is doing it. Um, and yeah, you can you can you can rail against some of these things, but I, what I'd like to do is to take those questions back to those root causes that I talked about earlier. And maybe it's not because the organization is making so much money at this, but they've got they, they've got thin instructors teaching thinner uh, participants, and and it's something that's gone so rapidly as agile. Although I don't think twenty three years is all that rapidly. Uh, but it, but you think it's been a viable movement for over 20 years. How many other software development and or management practices have stood the test of time like that? And I think, again, it's because it's rooted in a set of values that are sort of ongoing. One of the things about the methodology, and I, had a, I bought, sold, and taught methodologies all through the 80s and half of the 90s, and these, we, I call those the monumental methodologies of the time in the great big books and, and uh, you know, lots of documentation and lots of forms. And I taught all that crap for a while. But the one thing that they didn't have back then is they didn't have a set of values that were explicit. They had right. implicit values. Implicit value was that documentation was a, was a great thing to have because we had so much of it. Um, and, <clears throat> and excuse me. So that that's part of the history that I think people uh, don't recognize. And there was a there was a set of at one point in the early 1990s there were over a hundred vendors of computer aided software engineering tools. Right, right, yep. And most of them went bankrupt, but some of them then became the the core uh, knowledge base of the, the core impetus for other kinds of tools that came on later in the, in the after the turn of the decade. Yeah, and Lisa's here to help us get some questions. And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close that off by saying I agree with you. I mean, I'm asking what I wanted to be was a fairly provocative question. But to, me, to you and me, it's like it's not all that provocative because it's like, yeah, what did you expect? There was a movement and there's <laughs> a capitalism and there's opportunity. And the other thing that I point out to people is um, when people complain about some aspect of Agile, the complaining is as if the buyer, the customer was somehow stupid, meaning right. certifications are bad and people who get certified, uh, the, the HR people are stupid. Well, I'm not sure that's true. And I don't think it's true. And I think that what happens is, is 
is the markets tend to resolve on what is appropriate and it can take time. I mean, I also remember many, many of those case vendors and case tools, some of them were pretty sophisticated and they came along and they left because they actually didn't solve the job in, the, in, in referencing jobs to be done. They didn't actually solve the job better. So they didn't last. Okay, now with that, we've got about 15 minutes for questions, and I'm just going to do one real quick one. I'm going to give a shout out to Liz Sweeney, and she says the 10,000 hours rule has been debunked. So Liz, if you're still listening, uh, we would love as panelists, I would certainly love, and I'd like to thank you for that. I'd love to see what, um, uh, what you can share in the chat that would help us grow from that, because uh, there is, and maybe maybe it's, um, maybe the new law is that there is no need for any kind of experience. You just do a Johnny mnemonic and pump something into your brain and you're the expert. So I'd like to know when this is, um, uh, you know, Liz, I'd love to know for myself, and I'm sure other people would too, is, is what's the current thinking and what's the current research on the development of expertise. But with that, um, Lisa, do you want to pick out a couple of questions or do you want me to pick some out? How do we want to do this? I'll kick it off and then uh, let's see how we go. Maybe uh, like following uh, the answers to the questions, we'll uh, get into more of the details and we can come up with more insights. But thank you so much, everyone, for adding your questions. If you still have questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and also upvote questions because uh, we have 15 minutes left and there's already a bunch of them in there. So we want to make sure that we cover the most popular ones. So let's start with a question from Greg. Um, he asks, even after all these years, I see large struggles working with organizations that require a fixed scope and a forecast date for delivery, even mentioning no estimates, uh, angers those executives. How big of an obstacle do you see this mindset to agility? How do you address this dissonance? Well, one of the things that, <clears throat> Back in the mid 2000s, I started hearing a lot from agile teams, and this is just one aspect of that. What I got, what I heard from agile teams is they want us to be agile and flexible and adaptable, but they also want us to meet scope, schedule, and, and cost deadline or plans. And if you de deviate from the plan by 10%, that somehow you fail. And that used to be the old mindset. So you had a disconnect between the teams who are trying to do agile and the frontline managers who are trying to manage to the old style. So one of the things I developed was called the Agile a Triangle with value at the top, quality on one side, and constraints on the other. And the constraints were scope, schedule, and cost. I've always been able to do an Agile project to a fixed time schedule if you'll allow me or, or in, enable me to coordinate or collaborate with management to get some things adjusted. You can't fix everything. And so it's... <clears throat> It's, it's both a management challenge and a team challenge because a lot of the teams, they don't, they don't want any kind of accountability. They just want to be able to, you know, no, no accountability in terms of the traditional mode. I was in Munich, Germany years ago in front of about 18 software development managers. And these were second level managers from a big uh, electronics firm in Germany. And they said, our, our scrum master says we can't tell them how long it's going to take or how much it's going to cost or when we're going to be through. And I said, well, so what did you think? of?" What you, and they asked me what I thought about that. And I said, that's bullshit. You know, you have fiduciary responsibilities to your organization. You need to know some of those kinds of things. What you've got to be able to do is you've got to be able to negotiate some flexibility somewhere. If you're going to be flexible and change direction that you need to change, then you're going to have to have some flexibility in your measurements um, approaches. So, and so I think those are those are some kinds of things that need management and leadership changes as well as changes at the team level. I'm going to add, Jim, that um, uh, to that that notion of you know how what are the responsibilities is. I am decidedly not a fan of the no estimates movement. And because I agree with you that there are certain responsibilities that we have in, in, um, in Agile to, to create economic estimates. I think part of the challenge is, is that we have not broadened the training to include how to estimate. So I, I, I would 
I would offer, and I love the fact that people are sharing articles and books. This is really exciting. Um, but I would offer the book, How to Measure Anything, as a classic book that helps people learn how to estimate more effectively, how to put probabilities and ranges on their estimates so that we can estimate both the economic value of something. Wait, right. what, you know, I want to bring a new product to market. Okay, well, what's the possible profit margin? How would I price it? What's the value of that market? And from there, I can derive, well, here's pretty much my estimate range that I can, est you know, I can invest in building that product and then go back and forth with our development functions and say, can you build this thing, software or hardware or software, you know, hardware enabled by software? Can you build this thing in this set of ranges so that the two end up being a, a successful outcome? So I, I fully agree. And, I, and, 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 the, and the maddening thing is, it's not that hard to get vastly better at estimating and vastly better at making good economic choices on both the top side and the cost side. So um, the other thing keep... about agile, the, the only thing about agile development is that you can incrementally get value and cost. And so you have to continue to ask the question, is it worth 100 percent of the value for 100 percent of the cost or could I get 90 percent of the value for 80 percent of the cost? And you can make those kinds of trade offs in agile that you couldn't in previous ways of going about projects. Right. Lisa, pick another one for us. We yeah. got a few. We got a few more minutes here. We got a few more minutes, indeed, and we have a lot of questions to go through. Uh, next up, we have one from anonymous. So, Jim, your thoughts on what's the next step after Agile or Scrum? What do you feel is the future path of a Scrum master in the next phase of Agile movement? I get a lot. I get in a lot of trouble for this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we're going to go, number one, I think we're going to go more towards um, not frameworks or methodologies that you buy off the off of a vendor, but those that you put together yourself. My, my whole approach to coming up with a methodology, which is a series of practices that, that, that go across the life cycle, is to start with the simplest thing possible and then add stuff to it as you need it. Whereas the big framework approach is to give you all of this stuff and then you're supposed to take away stuff that you need for your particular project. I've always found it taken away was was really difficult. So I start small and build up. Um, and I think that's the way to do methodology. In terms of Scrum Master, and I'll put all of these Scrum Masters, Project Managers, and Agile Coaches in the same bin. You've got to increase your technical knowledge, period. That no longer can you, can you survive just on working with people and coaching the people side of it. You've got to be able to coach the performance side of it. And coaching the performance side of it means that you've got to have technical knowledge. So for example, how many, how many Scrum Masters, project managers out there have actually tried some of the AI tools and are playing around with them and experimenting and doing that kind of learning? Because I think the, the, the idea of a career path is over. You have an obstacle course you've got to traverse. So it goes from <laughs> career, career path to obstacle course. And you've got to be able to transition that obstacle course into how things are going to evolve. All right, Lisa, let's let's grab another yeah, one. Let's keep going. Thanks so much, Jim. Uh, next one. What are your views on agile teams working in the context of waterfall businesses? And how do you uh, advocate for spreading agile ways of working throughout the entire business? Ooh. Well, if you're trying to do an agile project in a, water, in a waterfall uh, company, you're 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 in trouble. And you know, well, you you got to change you got to change the mindset to a more of a growth mindset in the management side as well as the technical side. Otherwise, you're just going to be isolated projects. And and there were plenty of those in the beginning uh, of agile. I've dealt with a lot of teams. Uh, I I was was working with Mike Cohn one time and talking about what I call the rogue team period of agile development, where you just had, had, had these teams in organizations that were trying agile. And Mike went into one organization and, he, and said, oh yeah, we got three, three agile teams. And Mike found four and the manager didn't even know they had a fourth agile team. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that, that we were dealing with 20 years ago and we're still dealing with it today. And it's a very difficult situation. I would add that, um, 
be patient. Uh, one of the largest failure modes that I experience in the clients that we work with who are trying to continue down their path of Agile is that people get upset with the rate of change or they get um, impatient in some capacity. And if, if Agile is working in a small way in the company and there's this larger context of less agility, eventually the, the organization is going to start to recognize for its own health that it needs to start adopting some agile practices. And people in the chat might say, oh, you don't understand, Luke. That leader um, is, is holding us back. There's some senior leader. Well, I was working with an organization that had the same fixed mindset CEO for 30 years. And that person finally retired and they put in a new CEO and change started to happen. So I think the time horizon can be a, a very um, un, un, unfairly limiting to what can happen. And like Jim said, Agile's only been around, quote unquote, 23 years. That's not very long. And there are CEOs who have been around longer than 23 years. So letting, you know, being consistent, taking the wins, you know, nurturing that, that small Agile flame of goodness maintaining positivity, finding those, uh, the strategy of small wins by Carl Weick is really fundamental in building on wins. Um, and the culture and I, can go the other way too. Okay. I've, I've been in contact with several organizations where they changed the CIO from a growth mindset to a fixed mindset and it really undid all the agile stuff within the organization. So I've seen that happen too. Exactly. Um, um, maybe we do one more. And then what I would um, let people know is that we'll find ways to grab the questions and um, provide some thoughts on them through Applied Frameworks. And Jim and I may or may, Jim may do that. I know I will commit to that, but let's get one more. Yeah. Um, so I'm just taking a look because I see that there's a question that's been upvoted by Amy on the Agile certifications, but I think we spoke, uh, we touched on that a little bit. So uh -huh. let's go to the next one up. Um, why do you think there seems to be an industry move to eliminate the Scrum Master role in organizations? I don't think there's a move to, to eliminate it. I think there's a move to change the ratio of Scrum Masters to engineers. And I think it's gone too far the other way. So it's, it's, a, it's a rebalancing more than, a, more than getting rid of people. And so sometimes that rebalancing, you know, leads to some job loss. But I think one of the things that, again, one of the things that a scrum master can do to enhance their saleability within their organization is to become more technically competent as well as the other the other scrum uh, practices competent. Well, I, I would also, I, I wanna list that, that um, the, the, if you go to this scrum guide and we, we allow ourselves to limit ourselves to the scrum guide and the definition of scrum master, right? Among the things the scrum guide says is the scrum master is accountable for establishing, establishing scrum in, as defined in the scrum guide. And they do this by helping everyone understand scrum theory and practice both within the scrum team and the organization. Well, if you just take that first sentence, sometimes the scrum masters that I've worked with who were highly effective, they did view their job as I'm gonna get this organization stood up on scrum and I'm gonna create a self-sustaining entity and therefore, quote unquote, they don't need me or they need me much less. Like imagine you had um, poor dental health and you went to the dentist for several months to get your health and learn new habits. Well, then you might need to go to the dentist every, um, you know, four months. So you you can you you can really um, see the role of the scrum master as you know, am I really empowering the organization, and therefore maybe I'm not needed in a healthy sense, or am I really creating this kind of weird dependency because I'm a scrum master and I like my job and I don't want to lose my job, and I think that's really a, a really fundamental uh, framing of like how do you as a scrum master view your job and your responsibility relative to the organization you're working for. Okay. Um, 
Thanks so much, Luke and Jim. I know that we have a bunch more questions in Q&A, but with two minutes left, I want to make sure that we have time to wrap up the session properly. Jim and Luke, yes. thank you so much for the valuable conversation. I don't know if you have been keeping an eye on the chat. Luke, I know you have because I saw you posting in there as well. But Jim, just so you know, people have loved listening to your conversation and your valuable insights. The metaphors particularly were quite uh, enthusiastically received by our audience. So thanks everyone for joining us today. As Luke said, we'll try our very best to um, answer the questions that are still in Q&A and share them uh, together with the recording of today's session. If you want to review uh, today's sessions, you can do so through the recording. Again, thank you so much for joining. Luke, Jim, thanks so much for hosting uh, and having us today and taking the time out of your days. For those of you celebrating Valentine's, have a great Valentine's. For those of you who aren't celebrating, have a great rest of your Wednesday. It's just another Wednesday after all. Um, and thanks so much. And looking forward to seeing you all on our next edition. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thank thanks, you. Jim. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.